everybody i want to give you a really warm welcome to our time of worship for haywood baptist church i do hope that you've all been keeping well this past week even though it has been a very anxious time for all we particularly want to name and remember this morning the situation in russia and the ukraine and acknowledge that some of these things, because they feel closer to home, can feel like they are shaking our very foundations. But I pray that this morning, as we journey together in worship, that we might find comfort and peace and grace to help us in our times of need. You are welcome in this space there is more than enough room for you and i to share in the grace of god we're invited this morning by jesus himself to come and sit to come and listen to come and reflect to come and be changed into the image of god in which we are created. The invitation is open to you and I hope that this morning you will join me in your heart to worship God together. Let's begin by opening in prayer. Our gracious and loving God, we give you praise today for the gift of life that you have offered to us in and through Jesus Christ. We thank you that Jesus is the bread of life to feed and sustain us, and he is the living water that brings refreshment and renewal to us. Whilst we prepare our hearts, gracious God, to worship you, we pray for the world around us, where so many are in anxiety and distress. We pray that you will be the God of all peace and all comfort for those who are suffering today. We also pray that you will be the God of challenge to those in power who are using that power to control and abuse others. And we pray that in this world, more voices will arise that will speak truth to the powers that be. Truth about injustice and bloodshed. So that a way is made for the glory of Jesus Christ to be received in all minds and all hearts. So gracious God, as we commit to journey together now, we also commit our world into your hands that there might truly be peace and justice on earth. For we ask this in and through the name of Jesus. Amen. We're going to go and sing together now and then we're going to come back for a Bible reading and reflection. So I will be back with you shortly.
Our reading this morning is taken again from the book of John or the Gospel of John. And today we're in chapter 11 and we're going to be reading, it's quite a long reading. So it's from verse 1 all the way up to verse 44 and it reads thus. Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now laid sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, This sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. And then he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. But Rabbi, they said, a short while ago, the Jews there tried to stone you. And yet you are going back? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? Anyone who walks in the daytime will not stumble, for they see by this world's light. It's when a person walks at night that they stumble, for they have no light. After he had said this, he went on to tell them, Our friend Lazarus, has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I am glad I was not there so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Then Thomas, also known as Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, let us also go, that we might die with him. On his arrival, Jesus found Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. 
When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is come into the world. After she said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforting her noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Jesus reached the place where, sorry, when Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where did you lay him? he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odour, for he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. We've probably all had times in our lives where we've had a loved one, somebody really close to us who has been ill. Perhaps they've had an illness that you felt certain may have been leading up to death. And what's usual when you have that kind of situation is you invite all your close friends and family around. Perhaps it's because you need comfort from one another and also so you can say your last goodbyes. And so it's always disappointing in scenarios like that when somebody really important can't make it. I don't know, perhaps when a child is living in another country 
and a parent is suffering a great illness, an illness that may lead to death, and they just cannot get over. It's sad and it's disappointing. It's a little bit like during COVID when people were naturally dying as, as death is always here. And yet because of rules and regulations, people could not join and grieve together and say goodbye to loved ones. There's a certain amount of distress that happens in these scenarios. And here today we've got a story where a man that Jesus loves, Lazarus, along with Martha and Mary, um, they're in need. Lazarus is sick and the beginning of the text that we've read doesn't tell us that he's sick in a way that may lead to death. But clearly Mary and Martha are significantly distressed enough to want Jesus to come. And yet the strange thing about this story is Jesus doesn't go immediately to this situation of grief, despair, anxiety, distress. And you would have thought he would have done. I mean, this is Jesus who reveals a God of love to us. And yet, he's absent. Not just where the sickness is raiding, but when death comes too, Jesus isn't there. He's absent. Now, we know in John's Gospel that everything that John writes is to try to convince us and convince the readers that Jesus is the saviour of the world, the Messiah, the one in whom we must believe in. But this is a really strange thing, isn't it? That Jesus doesn't immediately appear when he's needed by those in distress. Now we get the sense, and you always get this in John, it always seems like Jesus knows and is in control. So Jesus almost explains his actions uh, in the light of a revelation of God's glory. Something's going to happen again, just like last week, where God would be glorified in the healing of that man born blind. Well, now um, Jesus's delay for some reason is so that people might believe. And so you get the impression that Jesus he knows that Lazarus is dead and leaves it this long so that he might reveal his glory in another sign, a sign that John will record. Now, when Jesus journeys back to the place where Lazarus is dead and he's met by Martha on the way, there is lament. Martha is distressed. And we get the same when Mary meets Jesus as well shortly after. There is lament. There is even anger, if you will. Jesus, why was you not present? Because if you was present, things would have turned out differently. Now, Jesus doesn't really tell Martha and Mary off. And I think that's because the good thing sometimes about honesty in Scripture is lament. Sometimes anger and distress can be part of a faith journey. Just because we say we have faith doesn't mean that everything goes smooth for us. And it doesn't mean we won't have emotions of anger, distress and lament and even accusation. Where is God in all of this? Now, of course, Martha, she's within her rights to lament because she really believes Jesus could have done something here. And she believes Jesus could have done something uh, because she wants she wants Lazarus back. She doesn't want Lazarus gone. Now, it's in this conversation with Martha, especially where we get hope spoken out by Jesus. 
Now, Jesus says to Martha, look, your brother will rise again. And Martha answers, well, I know he'll rise again in the resurrection at the last day. It's almost like Martha's saying, well, I know that, but I don't I don't want to wait until then. <laughs> you know, if you would have been here that, you know, this conversation wouldn't be happening. Now, Martha describes what, what was probably a common belief by all the Jewish people at the time, that there would be a resurrection on the last day, the day of judgment, the final day of reckoning. But what Jesus does in giving his words of hope, is he says something absolutely stunning. He claims something that nobody else has claimed before. And it's another one of these I am statements, one of the seven statements where the phrase I am is used. And I am is the equivalent to talking of God in the Old Testament when God reveals himself to Moses and Moses asks God, what name shall I give you when I see the people? And God says, tell them I am sent you. So this is a place where Jesus is making a really bold and shocking claim. Because he says, OK, Martha, you might believe in the general resurrection of the dead. But let me tell you that I am the resurrection and the life. I am it. I am the, the, the focal point of resurrection life. I am the one who is able to raise people up or not. And he says, to the one who believes in me, they will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? That's a very, very high claim that Jesus is making. Jesus is saying to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. And whoever believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. That's incredible words. It's almost as if Jesus is trying to get Martha into a place of personal belief now. In a relatable way, in a relational way. Martha, of course, now proclaims, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God who has come into the world. Martha now comprehends those words. And she's led to a place of faith. She hasn't yet got any answer. She hasn't got Lazarus back, but she's come to a place of hope in all of this. By believing in the very words of Jesus. Now, after this has happened, then Mary is sent for. And Mary dashes away and uh, the Jews who are lamenting with Mary, they also come with Jesus as well. And we get a sort of similar thing playing out where Mary is in distress but at this point now, Jesus moves on from talking about him being the resurrection and the life to go to survey the scene. Jesus is now going to reveal who he is, because every sign in John points to the reality of who Jesus really is. And the great thing about the action Jesus does in raising Lazarus here is it is all grounded in compassion. The miracle is couched in emotion and compassion. 
This isn't um, a cold clinical magician or miracle worker. Somebody who's kind of in things for himself. This is Jesus now being moved by compassion. Perhaps his discussions with Martha and Mary have brought him to a place of deep compassion. But when he realises the seed and all the emotion, Jesus is compassionate. He sort of imbibes that emotion and he understands the emotion and it becomes a motivator for this particular sign. Now, Jesus being deeply moved, he comes to the tomb and he asks for the stone to be rolled away. And Martha still hasn't totally got it, as, as she, because now she starts to say, oh, it's going to stink. He's been in there for four days. So even though she's confessed as the Messiah and, and believes that he is the resurrection and the life, there's still a kind of worry. It's as if Martha now is is teetering. She, she grasped hope, but now she's now she's at the point of um, seeing that hope delivered. And it's difficult. But Jesus then replies to Martha again, look, Martha, I just want to remind you, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? Then they take away the stone. Jesus prays, not for his own benefit, but for the benefit of the hearers, that they might believe when they see the sign and Jesus caused Lazarus to come out of the grave of despair and he comes out resurrection comes to the fore Jesus isn't just saying I am the resurrection and the life but he's displaying that in the very darkness of death. A story where there is absence, lament, hope, compassion and resurrection. Now I can mirror that story and say that story reaches out to speak to us today. He reaches out in a way to speak to us, to hold on to hope in the midst of despair. There are going to be times in, in the journey of life where the God who we desperately love and we desperately need does not appear to be with us. Or at least he is with us, but we can't sense nor understand it. And sometimes it is right for us to lament. And it's not that our lament causes God to act. It's that our lament brings us to a place where we're ready to see something fresh about who God is. In this story, Martha sees something new about Jesus. It's almost as if Martha's Faith or comprehension of Jesus is deepened. Sometimes we have to go through those times of absence. And even in grief, lament and get angry and, and, and do all kinds of things in order to clear the way for us to really encounter Jesus. Jesus proclaims to Martha and he does to you and I today, that he is the resurrection and the life. And that if we believe in him today, there is life for us in the here and now that overcomes the darkness around us. But also there is the hope of the resurrection to come too. But actually Jesus brings forward that resurrection to plant that life in the hearts of those who believe. And in John's gospel, this is specific. Hope that overcomes death is uniquely found in and through 
faith in Jesus Christ. But even when we have these fresh revelations or understandings of Jesus, Jesus never comes in anger when we are in lament and despair. He always comes in compassion to bring to bear something that reveals his glory and life in and through us. And just as Jesus approaches that tomb, that smelly tomb, because four days has Lazarus been decaying, Jesus can often and does often approach the places in our lives that seem to be dead and buried and gone. And he is able to speak a life into us that perhaps we wasn't ready for until we walk through the sadness of absence, the place of lament, Maybe sometimes absence, lament and darkness can become the very birthplaces of new ways and works of God in our world. Places of resurrection still exist for us. And so personally, I think this is the message out to you and I today. But it is also, I think, there is a message for us in continuing the work of Jesus in this world too. For those that name the name of Christ. That we are to be in places of lament. Not shirking the darkness of lament that others pass through but being present with others. And not being present in a sense to angrily say you shouldn't be lamenting because Jesus can do things, but actually offering a tangible hope to those who can only see darkness and death and despair. And we are taught too, aren't we, in this story, that whatever it is that we might be called to do in this world, in working for justice and love and inclusion, it must be centred and grounded on compassion. We have to imbibe hope and a vision of hope that enables compassion to work its way into and through this world. You see, if we act in compassion without a vision of great hope, we will get exhausted in acts of compassion. And so we ground and centre ourselves in the hope of the good news of Jesus. And then we are able to be the compassionate ones in this world that work for peace and justice and that pray for it and yearn for it, that signal the resurrection life of Christ to all. Perhaps today, Church of Jesus Christ, we are being called to enter into the despair and lament of what is happening, not just in the Ukraine, but in other areas of the world. Where nations are fighting nations, where power and control is esteemed. Perhaps we are called to fully open our eyes to those things, to be affected by the lament and grief there that we might find new ways of expressing hope, new ways of working in compassion, so that we too might move together to a place of resurrection where we finally get to see dead places come to life again. May we, the people of God, be the bringers of a kingdom of God, which is full of abundance and resurrection of 
life. Let us rise up and be carriers of grace into our world. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us as always this morning in our worship together. I do want to say that I pray 
and hope that the words of Jesus and the story we've heard today give you inspiration and encouragement to embrace hope in the midst of darkness and despair. Pray that the peace of God might wrap around you and wrap around the whole of this world. We want to enter, don't we, into life in this world to be bringers of peace and reconciliation. So may the words this morning and the journey that we've gone on this morning motivate us to serve our world in sacrificial love. And in order for us to be bringers of that, as we always do, we say the words of the grace. So may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and evermore. Amen. God bless you all and I look forward to speaking with you or meeting with you at some point over the next week. Saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught my heart. Amazing grace, the 